John chapter 13 is where we're going to begin. Matter of fact, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. This morning, I want to bring a message simply entitled, Living on a Heavenly Timeline. Living on a Heavenly Timeline. You can be seated. More than any other gospel writer, the Apostle John emphasized the fact that Jesus Christ Himself lived on a heavenly timetable. Now, there are several examples throughout the book of John, and I'm going to give you just a few. Because in some places he says, Mine hour has not yet come. Or, His hour was not yet come, and the hour has come that the Son of Man might be glorified. And the one we just read, Jesus knew that His hour has come. So time... And the heavenly timetable is very important to the Apostle John. Because each of these moments of time in the life of Christ are directly connected with Christ fulfilling the will of the Father. So what is a divinely appointed hour? What is a divinely appointed hour? Well, for us to understand a divinely appointed hour... Let us begin by understanding, and we must understand, God's divine timetable. God's divine timetable. Now, I need you to put your thinking caps on, go back to kindergarten, strap it on, and I need you to use your best imagination possible. I want you to imagine that this piece of molding up here is God's divine timetable. Now, from this point, with no end... And no time ever existence was eternity past. Now, if we run all the way to the other end of this timetable, from this point all the way to that end, time will no longer exist. That is eternity future. So we're dealing with this point of time, the point of time between these two points. So if we begin with the point of time, at about, and these times come from answers in Genesis that I'm giving you. They took it from the Word of God through genealogies and through what the Bible has recorded. So if we begin right here at this point. This is creation. This is when God stepped out of nothing onto nothing and spoke everything into existence. This is the beginning of time as we know it. This would be about 4,028 years B.C. Right here. This is and what happened at this moment of time. God created the heavens and the earth in six 24-hour days. And then He rested on the seventh. Now in that period of time, how do we know this is where time began? Because this is where God said, Let there be light. And let the sun and the moons, and let them divide the the times and the seasons. It began with time. Time began right here with creation. Now, it wasn't long after this creation of, of the things that we see. God created Adam, and then He created Eve. And so somewhere here in our timeline, very early on after creation, is when sin entered the earth. This is when uh, Satan came down. He spoke through the serpent. And as he spoke through the serpent, he deceived Eve. And this is when sin entered humanity. Not long after this is is when Cain killed his brother Abel for a little bit better sacrifice. You know, because of the sacrifice and jealousy. I mean, we could get into all that. But all this was right here at the beginning of time. Now, as we progress forward and we get to the year 2028 B.C. No, excuse me. 2038 B.C. We have Noah's flood. This is when the sins of humanity had got so grossly out of control that God destroyed everything except for Noah and his family. He saved them in an ark. 2038 B.C. We go 300 years in the future. After Noah's flood, we come to the days of Lot. 
and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, as I'm talking about time here, this is a first creation. This is the first major cataclysmic event in human history. Because with the beginning, with, with this history, with this, God created time. You got to keep that in your mind. So we're going through the Old Testament. We know Israel and everything that happened to Israel, carried Babylonian captivity to come back, Cyrus. We get all that. I'm giving you the fast forward. I'm speeding up the VCR a little bit. We get right here. Right here is the second major cataclysmic event. And this event right here changed time forever. Remember I told you creation began at 4028 B.C. But as we're heading to that moment of that second cataclysmic event, time decreases. We go from 4,000. I just told you Noah was 2,038. You know, uh, what, 300 years, uh, 1738, somewhere with Sodom. So we see time going down. We get to zero. Zero hour. Cataclysmic event. What happened that changed time forever? The birth of Jesus Christ. The Messiah, the Son of God, came to this earth, took on flesh, and He was born just like every one of us were born. Second major cataclysmic event right here. At 30 years of age, Jesus Christ began His earthly ministry. As when uh, the priesthood was, uh, remember, uh, when, when He was baptized in the Jordan, there was the Son of God being baptized, the Spirit of God descended like a dove, and the Father in heaven exclaimed, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Those are the three steps that the high priest would do. He would baptize with water, they would anoint with oil, and the Father would proclaim, This is my beloved Son, and He would pass the priesthood down to His Son, the oldest Son. So when we see those three events taking place in the life of Jesus Christ, the Father is passing the priesthood to His Son. Y'all just track with me. So for the next three years, Jesus Christ ministers on earth. At 33 years of age, He is betrayed by His own people. He is uh, completely uh, uh, whipped and bruised, and, and, and those were for our physical healing as well as our spiritual healing. He was nailed to a cross, and our sins were nailed to the cross. His blood was shed and, and fell to the ground for the remission of our sins. He Later, He would die. He would be buried in a borrowed tomb. But he didn't stay in this tomb. He broke out of the tomb, bringing with him the keys of David, the keys of death and of hell, and won victory over death and hell. Where are my... Loretta, you got to make sure, Miss Ann, I need that, I need that amen back. Y'all are too quiet. Maybe I'm confusing you with time. So here we are. Jesus Christ, he, he walks for about... He walks this earth for about 40 days. Then he ascends and goes back into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Ten days after that day of Pentecost is when the Spirit of God comes down. And we have Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon all flesh. So there's our first major cataclysmic time, creation. Our second is the birth of Messiah and the sacrifice and the reason to come. This changed everything because religion here was all about sacrifice and all about what we could do. But Christianity, this see, we cannot have Christianity or be Christians if this event never took place. It had to be Christ. So now, time, as it was counting down, is now counting back up. And I'm going somewhere with this. It's now counting back up. Zero, 33. And we have some major events that happen in the history of the church along this point of here. But then we come to right about here. Right about here, and I believe the date is May 14th, 1948. Let me take a check. Yep, I just want to make sure I'm right. May 14th, 1948. What happened here is when Israel becomes a nation. Now, I didn't say cataclysmic event, but it's a very poor, important event. And I'll tell you why. Go up a few more years. June 5th through 10th, you have the Seven Day War, 1967. That is when Israel defeats its foes. And they take Jerusalem. So now the holy city, Zion, Jerusalem, the city of God, is now brought back into the nation of Israel. And the two are united. This is very important, and I'll tell you why. Because when you come back over here, 
You got people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the minor prophet, Zephaniah, Obadiah, Joel, and they all begin to talk about the restoration of a nation and how the two olive branches. And, and so they go through all this prophecy, and what did they prophesy back here? That this nation would be destroyed. Christ predicted it would be destroyed, and it was. But they also predicted a time in which it was restored. So when we see Israel come back as a... No other prophecy that I'm getting ready to tell you could ever exist or happen if this event did not happen first. So for all these years, we've been waiting for the nation of Israel to come back, and it did. So once we've gotten to this point, time has now been fast-tracked. And it is speeding up every day. What is it speeding up for? Let me show you this way. Remember from this point, this way is eternity, eternity future. Time will no longer exist. Well, we're getting right along in here somewhere. Because at this point right here is the third major cataclysmic event in time. We have creation, we have the birth of Christ, but what we have at this point in this juncture is the end of this age, the rapture of the church, and the beginning of a seven-year period of time known as tribulation. And it's all going to happen at the same time. After that, you have seven years of tribulation. God's just, well, three and a half years of wrath of the Lamb, three and a half years of wrath of God. It's God's judgment against humanity for rejecting His Son and everything His Son has done and for how they treated Christians and how they treated the Jewish people. That goes on for seven years. At the end of, 10, at the end of those seven years, Jesus Christ comes back with ten thousands of His saints. And He says, Boys, watch this. Because Revelation says, out of his mouth proceeds a two-edged sword. In other words, Christ just speaks at the battle of Armageddon. And he vanquishes his enemies and his foes. He doesn't have to raise a sword. He, doesn't have, he just speaks a word. And is, everybody's defeated. At the end of that, we now go into the thousand-year reign of Christ. And at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ will be the great white throne judgment. At the end of that, now we're in eternity future where time no longer exists. Why did I tell you all of this in a nutshell? We have to apply 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. For with the Lord a day is as of a thousand years, and a thousand years is as of a day. So one day with the Lord to us in time is a thousand years. That's what it's, that's what it's saying. I told you God created everything in six 24-hour days and He rested on the seventh. I told you creation, according to the genealogists in the Word of God, creation happened at 4,028 B.C. Here. Now we're at zero hour. So that's 4,028 years. We're now at, and somebody please help me with this because I'm, I'm bad at math. What year is this? 2024. If you add the two together, you're somewhere, what, 6,000 and 50 some years, right? So we're past the 6,000 year mark. If a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is another day, boom, one day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day Six, the thousand-year reign of Christ is the seventh day of rest. How close are we in time? We are so close that if I had it up here where I could draw it, the third cataclysmic event, which would be the end of this age, the rapture of the church, the beginning of tribulation, and you would have to ask me, Paul, where do you think we're at right now? I would have to overlap my marker on that point and say, we're right there. Because time, we've already covered it. 6,000 years, we get ready to enter to a thousand year or, or, or the next the day of rest. Any moment at any time. So we're seeing the heavenly timetable unfold in our hour. 
our day. So let me do this way. John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, and that He had come from God and was going to God. In other words, He came from God. He was going to die go back to God. He rose from the supper, laid aside His garments. He took a towel and He girded Himself. After that, He poured water into a basin, and He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which He was girded. What would you do if you only had 24 hours left to live? We would all have to admit that we would enjoy doing something that either we did not have, make the time to do while we were alive or, hey, I'm getting ready to die anyway. I'm going to be a daredevil and I'm going to do something that I never did because I, honestly I thought I would die if I did it. Some people might go skydiving for the very first time. So with only 24 hours remaining, Christ chose to show the disciples one final lesson and that was of serving he was called Lord, Master, Rabbi, and yet Christ served His followers. Fulfilling the text that Christ came to serve and not be served. So the overall theme of Christ washing their feet deals with their holy walk. See, Peter began to exclaim that he needed to be washed all over. And that's what we, uh, that we all need if we, have, you know, if we have never accepted the gift of salvation. A, we need a thorough cleansing. But Christ only washed their feet, illustrating that as we walk in this world, we can easily be defiled. And we need to have this defilement removed in order to continue to walk with God. Now, I believe it also denotes something much deeper. Because Jesus Christ knew that His hour had come. That the betrayer was among them with only a few hours left. And he knew He would, was about to prepare to endure the cross. He would uh, no longer be with them to instruct them, to speak with them, to prepare them, or to guide them. They would have to rely on the teachings of Christ, and to continue to walk this journey out assisted by the Holy Spirit. And I recall uh, in the book of Leviticus, it's chapter 8, verse 23, when God instructed Moses to consecrate the priesthood, he would apply blood to the, uh, to the, uh, of the peace offering. He would apply it to the right ear, to the right thumb, and to the right big toe. By doing such, what he was doing was consecrating them, saying, Lord, give them an ear to hear your voice. Lord, the work that you put in their hands and what you're requiring of them, Lord, let that work be done for your honor and glory. But we're talking about feet. Probably, Lord, I ain't saying that. I would say probably one of the most ugliest things at feet. Smelliest things. See, by consecrating the feet, it was to remind every individual to walk in the ways of God. To walk differently than everybody else around you. Don't be like everybody else. But here's what, this is what just kept coming to me this week. It was also to prepare them for the journey that they were about to embark on. Because Christ would not be with them. It, they would be totally dependent on one another and of the Holy Spirit. They've never done that before. And so Christ was preparing them for their journey, their mission. What was Christ teaching His disciples? We know He was teaching them humility. Because humility, true Christian humility, seeks to bring glory and honor to God while, while looking out for the interest of everybody else and never looking out for our own self. It's about denying ourself, putting ourself away, and looking out for everybody else. See, it takes true humility and grace to really serve other people, but it also takes the same humility and grace to be served. See, even though God, it says right there, He placed all things 
in the hands of Christ. He had the power of heaven. He had, look, he had God, the, his Father, behind him to back up everything he said, every action he took, every prayer he prayed, everybody he laid hands on. He had all of heaven in his hands, but yet the Messiah, the Son of God, decided to go grab a towel and a wash basin. A towel and a wash basin. See, Christ's humility was not out of poverty, but it was out of His riches. He laid everything of heaven aside and said, they need me to wash their feet right now. They need me to show them through my life what it means to serve. See, Christ was dealing with their own selfishness and their pride. Their selfishness and their pride. See, if we're dealing with true Christian humility, we're looking out for everybody else. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You see, a humble person does not think about themselves at all. They're always concerned about everybody else. They're always concerned about the needs of someone else. They're always concerned. They're not worried about the time. They're not worried about if they have to miss something in their life. They're worried about, is that person getting everything that they need spiritually and physically? A truly humble person knows who they are in Christ. They know where they are in Christ, but they also know where they are going because of Christ. See, a humble person knows all that in the back of their head, and they know, I, look, I may not have much here, but I've got a reward in heaven. I, I, I've got my name written in the Lamb's book of life, and I'm doing as my Lord has done, so I know I'm going to make it to heaven. See, it's, it's not about right here, right now. It's about who we are, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. See, a humble person fully, and I cannot stress enough the word fully. A humble person fully yields himself to Christ to be a servant. We don't hold anything back saying, God, I'll give you this portion of my life. Hey, look, people are good like this. They marry, they might have a whole passel full of kids. Well, you know what, God, I'll give you my wife and my kids, but, but I still got to go do this. You can have him. You can have half of me, but, but my other half still got to go take care of this. If you're truthfully humble, you're truthfully looking to serve somebody, you'll be a servant. And you won't hold anything in reserve. You'll give everything to Christ. Your entire life, mind, body, soul, being strength, you'll give Him your finances, you'll give Him the house, you'll give Him the car, the cat, the dog, or whatever else you got. You'll give it all to God just so you can serve Him and be a servant. See, our eyes are turned away from ourselves, and what are we doing? We're not, we're not looking at ourselves. We're looking to other people. I see that you're hurting. I see that you're in need of prayer. I see that, that, that you need a glass of water. So we're looking to help. In 1 Peter 5, 5, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you. And do. See, we don't exalt us, and we should never exalt us. We should humble ourselves before Him and let God determine when is the time to bring us up and out. See, we should all have a servant's attitude. Every one of us. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross daily. We follow Jesus Christ. We, we lay everything aside, not just for those, but for even each other. If we cannot do it for each other in this room, there's no way we could go outside and do it for others. We've got to lay everything down for each other. See, we can never be submissive to each other if we're not submissive to God first. If my relationship with God is not right, and, I, and if God tells me, I need you to do this, 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 and this in your life, and I can't submit to Him, then I'll never submit to any of you in here. And if I can't submit to you in here, then I, I'm no good. I'm not, don't even go outside. Because you just make a mess of the community. It's about submitting everything to Him first. Not just the sins, not just the things we want to give up. Submit everything to God, then we can submit to each other. 
if we submit to one another, then we can go outside and rock this community for the kingdom of God. See, it takes grace to be humble. I can't do it. You're right. You can't. God can. God's grace is more than enough and more than sufficient, not just for our needs, but to help us live and walk in humility, to have a servant's heart and a servant's attitude. And the evidence, what's the evidence of that grace? You'll yield to each other in here. And also yield into Him. How do we do this? And what, what, how does it show or exemplify it? John 15, verses 12 through 14. This, it, this is Jesus Christ speaking now. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater, this is the, look, verse 13. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ goes on to say, you are my friends. If you do what I commanded you to do. See, God can command us to live this way, to give up, to do, but if we can't submit to Him, forget loving anybody else. Because we can't obey the command He's already tr- trying, uh, testing us with. Or trying to move in our lives. He says, if you're truthfully going to have love for your brothers and love for each other, what you'll do, you'll submit to God and you'll completely lay your life down for someone else. Perhaps Christ, in that room that night, sensed the competitive spirit within the disciples. Wayne, when Jesus Christ ascends. See, in that room that day, the, the, the two of the disciples' names was Wayne and Paul. Oh, Tommy. Tommy. Here's, here's what's going on, boys. I, I was here first. So when we get to the kingdom, I'm going to sit next to Jesus Christ. I don't know where y'all boys going to go. I'm going to sit right next to him. I'm going to take the seat next to him. No, you ain't either. I can hear it right now. No, you ain't either. I'm, now, I'm, this is Tommy. No, you ain't either, Paul. I'm going to get right in the chair with you. I'm going to be right there with you. <laughs> but they, were all, they had been competitive the entire time for the three years of this ministry. What could have influenced his actions was concern for their future. And maybe even the future of the church. See, if they fought so hard within his presence, wouldn't that competitive spirit drive a wedge between them when he's not there to correct them? Would would this wedge also destroy, like I said, the church, the future, or the establishment of what God had planned? So Christ's act of foot washing was a mean to express His love despite the flaws that He saw in His own disciples. Nobody in this room, nobody in this room, and I really don't care what you think about yourself or how good you think about yourself. Nobody here is perfect. And everybody makes mistakes. But we're quick to hold those things against somebody. See, when a spirit of offense comes in, it'll divide a church. That's a message for another time. But what we got to understand, I'm not perfect, he's not perfect, she's not perfect, you're not perfect, we're not perfect. But despite all our flaws, Jesus Christ loved us enough, he laid down his life for us. And if God did that and He's our example, then despite the flaws we see in each other in here, and despite the flaws that we see in this world around us, and the direction this world is taking, then should not we, if we love them the way Christ loved them, should we not be laying down our life for this world? Thank you for all two that said amen. <laughs> in Fox's Book of Martyrs, I I, kind of looked up quickly what some of the people who were doing in their last day, in their last hours, because it's all recorded. And so this is what I came across. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in prison just hours before he was beheaded. 
was still writing letters to the church to encourage the church. In hours leading up, he, now Nero was the emperor of Rome who burned Rome down, persecuted the Christians in the games and beheaded them. And what he didn't understand is the apostle Paul in his last days and hours before he was beheaded by Nero, he had won Nero's wife, his family, and the servants of the house to Jesus Christ. In his last hours, before he laid his life down, he was concerned about those who were getting ready to take his head. The apostle Peter was also in prison in Rome around the same time Paul was. And just before he was crucified, upside down, because Peter said, I am unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord and Savior. So they crucified him upside down. He won the guards in the prison cell that were holding him captive. He won them to the Lord. I look up Timothy. Remember young Timothy? Paul wrote a couple letters to him to encourage this young pastor in the church. When I read this, I marveled. Because the only thing I could see is today's society. In the town in which he lived, there was rioting, there was looting, there were people having marches down the street so that they could worship false idols and live lewd and lasciviousness ways. And in the midst of all that was going on, they were burning the place down, they were looting. I mean, does that not sound familiar to today? Did you see the nations of the world? And what are they fighting over? I want to do what is right within my own eyes. Timothy, young Timothy stood up. This was AD 94. Young Timothy stood up in the face of all those people marching at him and he began to preach Jesus Christ crucified and coming again for all those who believe. He began to preach Jesus Christ to try to save those who wanted idolatry, who wanted uh, uh, same-sex unions and things like that within that city. And Timothy stood up against the culture of that day. Now you may wonder well, what happened to Timothy. The mob carried him outside the city and stoned him to death. But in his last moments, he was still standing against society, preaching Jesus Christ. He laid down his life for his Lord. The Apostle John died in Ephesus of natural causes. But what was he doing in his last day, last hours? He was still standing in the church preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ, maybe even the book of Revelation, because he, he, he had written the book of Revelation a few years before. But he was actually tending the church that the Apostle Paul had started in the city of Ephesus. Right to the last moment. In their last moments, they imitated their actions, and they loved others, even to death. So they expressed their love with their actions. See, love is an act of the wheel and is also the proof that love is not in our feelings it's not in our words but our love is expressed through our actions we can all attest to the spiritual condition of this world and we know the direction in which everything is heading unless God intervenes but we also know we know the solution to this world's problem so if you were taking a test, and somebody had the answers to the test, and they were given up, I can help you, I've got the answers. Wouldn't you take their help? Yeah. I might have done better in school if they'd have let that happen. An expression of our love would be to share the answers or the solution to humanity. That's how we show Christian love and humbleness to this society is by saying, I love you so much, no matter what it may cost me, here it is. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He uh, crucified. He was buried. He rose, he rose from the dead. And He's coming again for all of them believe. Just like Timothy. To stand in the face of the opposition and by the Spirit of God to boldly stand and declare Jesus Christ to this community in this world. If we love them enough and we love our God enough that that's what He did and His followers did, then should we not be standing up 
and letting our voice be heard, not just in the polling booth or voting, but should we not be letting our voice be heard and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's the same today. Nothing has changed. Scripture teaches what has been is what will be, and there is nothing new under the sun. And you can sit here and make it, well, it was different in Jesus' day. Well, the Bible tells you there's nothing new under the sun. What has been always will be. We're facing the same thing now that they faced then. They stood and laid down their lives for humanity. But religion and today's modern Christianity is not standing. It's laying down and letting society walk over them. Mm, that'll preach. But here's the purpose of, purpose of today. John 13. I'm going to read verses 6 and then I'm going to skip to eight, towards 8 and 9. We're going to just skip verse 7 there. So John 13, begin verse 6. He came to, uh, then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Verse 8. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Different message, but you, that maybe that will come to you later. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So think about that. If you don't obey what God's telling you to do and you don't let God wash you and cleanse you, then God's going to tell you, then you have no part with me. Keep reading verse 9. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands, my head. And he goes on, wash it all of me. Oh, I want to make sure I got this thing covered. Wash it all. See, they had been celebrating Passover, a time which they remember when God delivered His people out of the hands of Pharaoh, and they were going toward the promised land. And there are many elements in this feast and, and, and a very specific order that everything is taken and consumed and everything means something, a lot of symbolism in, in Passover. But each piece brings to mind the, the minute details of their deliverance and how it was their responsibility to share that deliverance with the world. And they did not do it. That's why God would eventually turn to the Gentiles. But it was Peter on this night who was being very observant. He was watching every move Jesus Christ made. Now I can imagine the tension building in that room. As not only were they competing with each other, but every one of them sensed there's something major about to happen. There's something major coming. And as they were arguing, arguing over who would be the greatest, Jesus Christ never uttered a word. He just simply stood up. He drew the attention of Peter. And not knowing what Christ was going to do next, he continued to watch as Christ grabbed the cloth, he grabbed the basin, and he began to wash his feet. Now this act was disturbing to Peter because he knew what was coming next. Now the more he washed and the, and the more feet Jesus Christ washed, the more he could not understand what was going on and the more Peter was being provoked. Until Peter finally had enough and basically said, What are you doing? Why are you washing their feet? He's been kind of known to blurt out. But when we witness others doing what we are not willing to do ourselves, it's going to provoke you. You will come to the realization that you are not doing enough or anything at all for the kingdom of God. You see, we have become too concerned as to our position in the kingdom, rather than worrying about whether others make it into the kingdom as well. See, we are provoked not by what others are doing or not doing, but by the example set for us by Jesus Christ. Like Christ, as believers, we know we have been born of God, we know we are going to God, and in Christ we have access to all things. So we ought to be able to follow our Lord's example and to serve other people. It should be easy for us. The Word of God, and it's extremely important, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but the Word of God, it can stir you up emotionally. 
You get to reading the exploits of David and Samson and, and all this. Or look, you, man, you start reading Acts chapter 2, and you're like, whew, man, I can feel that one. Maybe that, that wind will run through this church one time. So the Word can stir us up emotionally. The Word of God will enlighten us intellectually. You study the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and you'll begin to understand more about God. But the Word of God cannot bless us spiritually until we do what Jesus Christ has told us to do. The blessings of God come when we obey what God has commanded us to do. And that is to love others and to lay our, lay our lives down. You see, in James 1.22, he says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So James uses an analogy a lot in, in, in his writings, and he talks about a mirror a lot. Looking deeply into the mirror. And many of you say, hey, because I've seen you throughout the week sometimes. You looked into a mirror before you showed up at church. Everything had to be right. But God's talking about look deep within. Because if you look deep enough, it'll truly reveal the heart that you have. If we look deep enough, every one of us, we're, and be honest, there are some things we're going to look at we, we don't want to see. And we're not going to like it. We're not going to be pleased with it, and it'll provoke us. It, it, it'll make us feel guilty, make us feel shame, because something is not right. So in order to be a doer of the Word, we cannot go to the Word and just take a quick glance. If you took a quick glance today, some of you would only have half a face put on. The other half would scare everybody to death. We'd have to have a resurrection service. You cannot look quickly. We've got to let the Word of God look deep and let it change us and shape us and mold us. We've got to let the Word of God speak to us and not just speak to us, but we've got to hear the Word, not listen to it. We've got to hear it and obey what the Word of God is telling us. We cannot look back, just like today, John chapter 13. There's no way we can look at that today, even though I'm just kind of briefly going over it. There's no way we can look at it and not feel provoked and be like, man, look what Christ done and look how it moved. It should move us. We can't look at any of the examples of Jesus Christ and simply walk away and not feel provoked or not feel guilty. There's no way. If you do, you really need to go and spend a lot more time in the mirror. James 1.25, he says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in, in it and is not a, listen to this, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, the Greek theologian Kenneth Wiest, the last part of that, you know, where I just read this one will be blessed in what he does, Kenneth Wiest, Wiest translates it this way, that this man... He's not a forgetful here, but he's a doer. This man shall be prospered spiritually in his doings. He said that's the proper way it should be translated. See, many Christians are struggling right now. We sense and know something is coming and something is about to happen. But why are many Christians struggling? It all goes back to a lack of obedience. We hear the word, we're moved by the word, but we're not obeying the word. And what did James just caution us about? He says, don't be a casual hearer or a forgetful hearer. Because if you're a forgetful hearer, you forget what you've been taught. You forget what people have been trying to tell you or trying to encourage you. A casual list, uh, listener is with somebody. Let me put it this way. A ca here's a casual listener. This way, am I, I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I, am I a hearer and doer of the word or am I a casual listener? So let's, let's break that down right now. How do I know which one am I? Because a casual listener is when somebody comes to you and asks for prayer, and we never pray. <coughs> let's let that sink in. A casual listener 
never hears the problems in other people's lives, and if they do, they're not concerned about it. And they never seek to see which way they can help that individual out. See, if you wish to prosper spiritually, it's about digging deep and putting actions to words. By putting action to our words, then we are blessed when we act. You are blessed when you help the least of these among us. Because you just don't listen, you hear and you do. We talked about time earlier when we started. The 6,000, a little over 6,000 years of history the earth has been here so far. Let me read to you a famous scripture about time. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the words of Jesus Christ. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And what does he say? And lo, I am with you always. And what does he say there? Even to the end of the age. The third cataclysmic moment in time. He says, you do what I've commanded and I will be with you even to this point. The end of the age. See, we are set for this, this next cataclysmic event and it's going to reshape history and it's going to reshape time once again. Remember, I noticed the words, the end of the age. See, it is because of the Word of God and the prophetic events that are transpiring that we know we're converging to the end of this age, which means what? The rapture of the church. Seven years of tribulation, the beginning of tribulation. We know this is about to happen. But Christ, what did He say? Even though you know these things are about to happen, what did He tell us we must do? He says, the world is going to ask you, how many people work for you? Tommy, you have a car detailing business. How many people work for you? Uh, Caton's Plumbing, how many people work for Jimmy? See, that's how the world sees this. But God is asking the church today, how many people do you work for? How many souls are you trying to win? How many disciples are you training right now? How many have you personally led to the Lord? You see, the word for the church at this moment is and has always been, go. Go. Go and make disciples. Go and preach the gospel because it's going to be preached to the end of this age. He says you go. See, we can't not, no longer afford to stay in the comfort zone of our homes or within the four walls of this church that God has blessed us with. God never said that it was going to be a perfect time. He says you go. He never said that it was going to be easy. He says, you go. He never said all of humanity would accept what you believe or be uh, receiving of the word that you have. But what did he say? Go. He says, you go. Matthew 24, verse 14. What is, this is another prophecy dealing with the time of the end. He says, and the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the world. As a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. You see, this command by Christ to go is our being a part of the fulfillment of end time prophecy. See, this gospel, he says, it's got to be preached. It's going to be a witness. It's going to show everybody the end is coming. You need to get ready. The end is coming. Christ is about to come back. Don't be caught without any oil. Don't be caught with your light out. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Be ready. Be prepared. See, the solution to everything that's going on is very simple. Go. Go into this world. They're looking for a Savior and that He cannot be elected. Because the Savior has already come and has done His work. See, we've got to point people to Jesus Christ. And we've got to go and we've got to make disciples. Because time, remember, how many years have we already been? 6,000? 50, basically 48, 50 years, something like that. So we're already out of time. We're on borrowed time now. But the rest is coming. I got to give you a thought as we close. For the last couple of months, 
This mandate to go, honestly, has just been burning in me. I just didn't know how to present it. And like Peter, I find myself being provoked to share the gospel message. Even to those who really don't want to hear it or they really don't care. And I have found myself challenged not only to contend for the faith, but to be emboldened enough to share my faith without apology. If someone asks, I share. And it's probably not what they're going to want to hear, but I share it. When the subject of church comes up, I invite. I look for my opening and I invite them here. I want to make sure they're in a good Bible-believing church. I invite them here. Let me tell you how this thought has recently provoked me. And I know y'all may or may not believe me, but I'm just telling you, I am by nature a very shy person. And it is hard for me to go to somebody I do not know and just talk. this, This goes against everything that I am. But recently, to tell you how this has provoked me, How many times has someone come to us and come to me or you? Hey, just keep me in your prayers. Pray for me. We always say that we're going to pray. But how many times has days, weeks, or months gone by and we're doing something and all of a sudden it's like, I forgot to pray. We remember the request, but we're like, oh my Lord, they asked me for prayer. See, we're saddened because we didn't pray. We didn't obey. We're, we're provoked. The Spirit of God is provoking us. Look, life becomes hectic. The phone rings. We're busy at work. And the thought of that request, it slips our mind. But it shouldn't be an excuse. See, we're real good at listening, but we fail at hearing. And when we are not hearing, we are not doing. Recently, I attended a funeral, and, that, and like I said, in this funeral, I did not have to officiate, but I was, we were part of the funeral. And after the graveside service, everybody just hanging around the tent, talking, and I mean, everybody just kind of hanging around talking. Really, nobody really left. We were hanging out by the road with a group of people, and we were just, we were just talking, and an elderly gentleman come up from behind me. I didn't see him coming. And we asked each other, uh, you know, you know, we, hey, how you doing? How you doing? You know, begin a small talk. He began to tell me everything that was going wrong with him physically. And I'm going to be honest with you. As my witness, as he was talking, it was like it just went, it just went quiet. And the, this is the thought that hit me. Well, you asked him how he was doing. What are you going to do now? That's all I heard. He asked me for prayer several times. Brother, pray for me. Brother, pray for me. Brother, pray for me. So, he asked. And so I looked back at him and I just simply asked, do you really want to be prayed for? Oh, yeah, 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 yes. I I, I want to be prayed for. I really want to be prayed for. Well, let's pray then. So I put my hand on my back and I began to pray. I know in that prayer, I felt the Spirit of God. I know He felt the Spirit of God. Because you can see it. And here we are on the side of the road at a funeral. But here's my point. There was other people watching. Now some people didn't know what was going on. They were further away from us. And they continued their conversations. And that's cool. But there were some people who were close to some on this side of the tent. That when we began to pray. They witnessed a hearer, a doer, faith in God, and they saw servitude. It's not about this any longer. He's here, he's here right now, and he needs prayer. The only reason why I shared that with you is because, like I said, how God has been convicting me over the last several, two or three months. We must become bold about our faith and about the God that we, that in which we believe. We must uh, allow God and, and, and let God work in us and fulfill the commands of God to preach the gospel, to baptize, to make disciples, and to go. 
We are to contend for our faith and to be bold about our faith and to move and walk in faith. He says that the just shall live by their faith. We are in the final hours before another major shift in God's divine timetable. Are we going to be hearers or are we going to be doers? What are we going to be? What are you going to be? Everybody, please stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed.